Hello, this is the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Thank you so much for tuning into this video in which we will review everything we've gone through in week 12. So we went through trigonometric graphs and also compound angle formula. Let's start with the graph. So let's say I want to graph y equals sine x. So how do I graph something like this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to find a few points through which this graph passes and I'm going to join them up. So to find a few points, I'm going to use the unit circle here. So remember, if we had an angle here, and sorry, I've got to call this angle X because I'm doing the graph of sine X. So remember, where it hits the unit circle, the X value of this point is cos of the angle and the Y value is sine of the angle. So with that in mind, at zero degrees, we see the Y value is zero. So sine of zero is zero. Then we go increasing sign, it will be positive, positive number, more than zero, and it gets to a peak of one. This is the highest value sign can take is one at 90 degrees because the y value here is one. So sine of 90 or sine of pi on two is one. Similarly, over here, the y value is zero. So sine of 180 is zero, sine 270 minus one, and sine of 360 is zero. Again, to get all these points, I just took the y value each of these points here. So how would I get something like sine of 450? Well, 450 degrees would be like going around the full circle, that's 360, and then another 90. So sine of 450 is the same as sine of 90. Similarly, sine of 540 is the same as sine of 180. So basically, if you take an angle theta and you add or subtract multiples of 360, we've got the same angle. Sine of 630 will be the same as sine of 270 down here at minus 1. So now I'm just going to join them up. So sine goes through the origin, it increases, reaches its peak, stops, turns around like this. So in fact, the graph of y equals sine x, it just goes up and down forever and ever. What about the graph of y equals cos x? So we're going to do something very similar to what we just did. So at zero degrees, the x coordinate is one. Remember, cos of the angle is the x coordinate at the point. So cos of zero is actually one. So cos starts at its peak. Over here, the x coordinate is zero. So cos of 90 is zero, and then cos of 180 is minus 1, and then it goes back up to 1 at 360. Same as for the sine graph, cos of 450 is going to be the same as cos of 90 degrees, cos of 540 is the same as cos of 180, and cos of 630 is the same as cos of 270. So the cosine graph starts at its peak and goes down, stops, turns around, it goes up and down forever and ever. So the graph of y equals sine x and cos x, they are very, very similar. If I just shifted this black one 90 degrees to the right, or shifted the yellow one 90 degrees to the left, they would lie on top of each other. That's why they're very similar. So when you're graphing, you need to know whether x is in degrees or radians. The only thing that changes is the numbers along the x-axis. Otherwise, the graphs look exactly the same. All right, let's now look at graph of y equals tan x. So remember that tan x is actually sine x over cos x. At the point, it's the y value divided by the x value. So tan of 0 is 0 over 1. So it starts at the origin as well. But then if you try to do tan 90, you get a problem because cos 90 is 0. Sine 90 is 1. 1 over 0 is undefined. You can't actually take tan of 90 or tan of pi on 2. So it turns out that there's an asymptote here. So at 180 degrees, tan would be 0 because it would be 0 over 1. You can have 0 over 1, but you can't have 1 over 0. But if we go tan 270, we get the exact same problem we had before. It would be 1 over 0 because cos 270 is 0. So there's actually an asymptote at 270. Remember that 450 degrees is the same as 90 degrees. So there'd be an asymptote there as well. In fact, for the tan graph, there's an asymptote every 180 degrees. In between them, you get pieces of the graph that look like this. Looks almost like a cubic inflection point. But this is what the graph of y equals tan x looks like. As I said, it's in all these pieces with asymptotes at 180 degrees. All right, let's now look more at the graphs of sine and cosine functions. 
So we're going to graph functions of this form, whether they're sine or cosine functions. They're totally determined by the four coefficients A, B, C, and D. So when graphing them, I just find it easiest to plot the features in this order, D, A, C, B. So C and D are not new. C shifts the graph left and right. Remember, C is positive, shifts it left. C is negative, it goes to the right. And D shifts the graph up or down. The things that are new are A and B. B. So A is the amplitude of the graph. It's the distance from the, what this will be, the mean line to the maximum value. Also the distance from the mean line to the minimum value. B, on the other hand, is the number of cycles per 360 degrees or 2 pi. But B is even more useful as from B we can find the period. So B is not the period. The period is 360 divided B or 2 pi over B. The period is the distance between peaks, which will be very useful when we come to graph them. So we're going to graph these two functions here. They're exactly the same except one's a sine and one is a cosine function. So for both of these functions, we'll start by finding D. D is 1. That means the mean line is 1. So we can draw a horizontal line here at Y equals 1. And this will sort of cut the graph in half. So the amplitude is 3 in both of these. A is 3. So the maximum value for both of these functions is going to be D plus the amplitude, which is 4. The minimum value is D minus the amplitude, which is minus 2. So for both of these functions, the maximum value is up here at 4, and the minimum value down here at minus 2. So what that means is both of these graphs will live between minus 2 and 4. They'll go up and down, up and down, up and down. The thing that we will get from finding C and B is where they will hit their peaks and where they will hit the trough. So for both of these functions, you might think straight away, oh, cool, C is pi, but it's not. To find C, it needs to have a second bracket inside here. So when it doesn't, we're going to factorize. So what we do is we take out the coefficient of x, which is 2, and we need to divide this term by 2. So this will be x plus pi on 2. So creating this second bracket means that C is not pi, it's actually pi on 2. And similarly here, we factorize by taking out the coefficient of x. So the phase shift is pi on 2, but because it's positive, we actually go to the left. See, normally when we're graphing sine and cosine functions, we start here at the y-axis. But because we've shifted it pi on 2 to the left, we're actually going to start here. It's almost like our axis is over here now. Now, for both of these functions, B is 2, and because B is 2, that means the period is 2 pi divided by 2, which is pi. So the distance between peaks is pi. So let's put this all together. Now, cosine graphs are easier. I'll tell you why that is. That's because they always start at their peak. So remember I said because we've shifted pi on 2 to the left, we're sort of starting here. Cosine will start at its peak. Now, because the period we decided was pi, the next peak I add pi. So minus pi on 2 plus pi is here. This will be the next peak for cosine. And then if I add another pi, I'm here. These are all peaks. Now, the troughs, the low points occur halfway between the peaks. So cosine graph, it will be at a low here. It will be at a low here. Again, I'm adding pi each time. So that's really simple. The cosine graph, I can just join up all of this. So this is the cosine graph in yellow. So to do the sine graph is a little more tricky because it's hard to find where that first peak occurs. So we shifted over, so we're starting here at minus pi on 2. The period is pi. So if I add pi to that, I end up here. This distance is pi. So between these two green lines should be one full cycle of both the sine and the cosine graph. It turns out that sine graphs reach their peak a quarter of the way through a period. So if I have a distance here of pi, quarter of that is pi on 4. So if I add pi on 4, I end up over here at negative pi on 4. That's where the first peak will be. So because the period is pi, the period's the distance between peaks, the next one will be at 3 pi on 4. 
And then the next one at seven pi on four over here. And of course, halfway between the peaks will be the trough. So that's one way you can find the first peak of a sine graph. It's a lot harder than for the cosine graph. The second way that you can do this is recall that sine x reaches its peak at pi on 2. So you can solve whatever's in the brackets is equal to pi on 2. So if I get 2x plus pi equals pi on 2, I'm going to subtract pi from both sides. And then I'm going to divide each side by 2. So you can see I get x equals minus pi on 4. And that's the thing I got before. You can use either method, either like the shifting method or solving an equation. You only need to do it for signs because finding the first peak is difficult. For cos, it's really simple. The first peak will be just let x equals 0 and it'll be whatever that number is left. So either way, the sine graph is going to look like this, up and down, up and down. Remember, cos and sine graphs are exactly the same, except they're phase shifts of another. If I just shifted this one a little bit to the left or the yellow one a little bit to the right, they would lie perfectly on top of each other. All right, let's now look at the compound angle formula. So we need to know these three compound angle formula. They're very useful helping us prove trigonometric identities, which are basically just helpful formula involving the trigonometric ratios. And also they allow us to find exact values of sine, cos or tan when the angle is a multiple of 15 degrees or pi on 12 radians. So how you read this, see, we've got a plus and minus in each of them. So the plus corresponds to what's on top. So if there's a plus here for sine, there's a plus here in between these terms here. Similarly, alpha minus beta, there would be a minus in between the terms. But for cos, it's the opposite. If it's alpha plus beta, there's a minus in between the terms and if it's alpha minus beta, there's a plus between the terms. Similarly here, plus corresponds to a plus on top, minus on the bottom, and a minus here corresponds to a minus on the top and a plus on the bottom. Okay, let's look at actually using those formulas. So firstly, let's look at cos of pi on 2 minus x. So obviously, I'm going to use this cosine formula here, and because I have a minus, there will be a plus between the two terms. So using that formula, it is cos of the first times cos of the second plus sine of the first times sine of the second. So I can simplify this really easily because I know that cos of pi on 2 is 0, sine of pi on 2 is 1. So this whole thing is just 0 and I'm left with 1 times sine x, which is just sine x. So it turns out cos of pi on 2 minus x is sine x. So remember pi on 2 is like 90 degrees. So this means like cos of 60 degrees would be sine of 30 degrees. Cos of 10 degrees equals sine of 80 degrees also means cos of 45 degrees equals sine of 45 degrees. This is a trigonometric identity. All right, let's do the next one, tan of pi plus x. So we're obviously going to use this formula here. So because we have a plus in between, we can have a plus on top and a minus on the bottom. So this will just be tan of the first plus tan of the second, all divided by 1 minus tan of the first times tan of the second. Now note that tan of pi is 0, so this is just 0 plus tan x on top, and on the bottom it's 1 minus 0 times tan x, so it's just 1. So tan of pi plus x equals tan of x. This is a trigonometric identity that we knew from the unit circle. So for example, tan of 30 degrees equals tan of 210 degrees. Tan of 60 degrees equals tan of 240 degrees. So for this last one, we will see how we can use compound angle formula to find exact values of things like sine of 75 degrees. So how would we do this? Well, we want to write 75 as the sum or difference of two exact values that we know. Now, we know the exact value of sine 45 and also the sine of 30. So I can write it like this, because of course 75 is 45 plus 30, and I'm going to use this formula up here. So using that formula, it's going to be sine of the first times cos of the second plus sine of the second times cos of the first. 
Okay, so I know that sine 45 is 1 on root 2. Cos of 30 is root 3 on 2. And then we have sine of 30 is a half. Cos of 45 is 1 on root 2. So we can easily simplify this. This is root 3 over 2 root 2 plus 1 over 2 root 2. So since the two denominators are the same, I can just add the numerators. It'll be root 3 plus 1 over 2 root 2. That's the exact value of sine 75 made possible because of compound angle formula. All right, thank you so much for tuning into this video. This has been the luckiest maths teacher in the world. Have a great day.